Yay. Last week of course content, chapters 15, 16, and 17 on deck. Uh, probably 15 is the most important chapter we cover in this semester. Uh, it's the integration and response to cranial nerve input and then autonomic motor output. Notice I slowed down and stressed autonomic motor output. We tend to look at autonomic sensory control in AMP2, but for right now, um, unless you're reading closely, you'll never figure that out inside chapter 15. But essentially all we're concerned with is what are the effector targets for the autonomic nervous system. Hey, Caleb. Hey there. How's it going? It's Monday bloody morning. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> and everybody's chipper and ready to go. No. <laughs> okay. Well, at least we can all be working on it. Exactly. Kick ass. So I hope everybody has some coffee. Um, yeah, like I said, probably the most important chapter we cover all semester long. And it really is a chance to separate and integrate information for both the somatic nervous system and the autonomic nervous system. And by that, I mean, what I'm going to try and do is teach it to you as though you are learning it through the lens of what we covered in 12 through 14. And now we're going to overlay a little bit more integration. Okay. Let's get the bloody hell to work. Let's share screen. Let's do this crap over here. Woohoo. Let's go there. Yay. Okay. Sophia, good morning. So, thinking about, let's do this. Wham. Let's go like this. I don't know, some weird ass color. Something you can see. Let's go. Red. And what have I just drawn for you here? Blue, green, green, red, red. Anybody? Different like nervous system innervations. Yeah, okay, it's a good start, but there's a pattern there. What's the pattern I'm trying to get you to learn? Let's start with those two red reds. Uh, let's go over here. Let's go like that. Let's go like that. Let's go like this. Dot, dot, dot. And let's put ACH over here. If this is a if this is a money making game. If the prize was for one hundred thousand dollars, the prize is just now dropped down to seventy five thousand. Okay. The red is a motor neuron. Kick ass, Evelyn! Fantastic. So, but which motor neuron is it? Is it Evelyn or e Evelyn? It's Evelyn. <laughs> yeah, it's Evelyn. <laughs> <laughs> which motor neuron is that she's like it's the week three it's week four and you're just asking is it evelyn or is it evelyn i don't know well you got me there <laughs> okay that's good well that's that's when you know you don't know something right is it a low, lower motor neuron? It is the lower motor neuron. Kick ass. Ding, 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 <laughs> ding. You're like, yes, it's Monday morning. You can't cut do that shit now. Okay, which means this motor neuron here is which one? Upper. Kick ass. Motor neuron. Now the million dollar question, which you won't get out of me because I don't make a million dollars. I don't think I've made a million dollars in my life yet. <laughs> okay. Where did this start? Nicole, you awake yet? Uh, 
<laughs> I'll take that as you are awake, but you have no idea what I'm asking. I just don't know how to answer that right now. Okay, <laughs> the, cool. the actual question. <laughs> so if this is our upper motor neuron and this is our lower motor neuron, where did this start? Oh, God. Ooh, sorry. <laughs> I'm not swearing that you don't know. I'm swearing that it's Monday morning and I would rather be back and sleep in bed, whatever, yeah. Uh. Um, is it like in in the brain awesome where psmc has I nothing heard. to do with the marine corps i don't know <laughs> somatic motor cortex anybody all right so let's keep working backwards let's go like this it's okay if you don't know. Is this cerebral cortex? It is the cerebral cortex. Great. Okay. Well, I'm going to want to know where in the cerebral cortex in a minute. Okay. Notice what I'm doing here. Notice what I'm doing here. I'm color coding it for you. Yes, no, maybe. So that when I draw this, And this is when Amy goes, that's how it all makes sense now. No? <laughs> okay, so remember I started with, if here's the acetylcholine that's gonna come at some motor effector, the lower motor neuron and upper motor neuron, the upper motor neuron would begin here. I'll just draw, hopefully this is red, probably blue, isn't it? Just double check before I start drawing. It is red, fantastic, fantastic. I'll draw a skeletal muscle fiber for you guys. Yay, because you're special and you're awesome and you're still with us four weeks into the semester. <laughs> you're like, yeah, <laughs> that's right. You're still here. You're still standing after all this time. <laughs> Using your lower motor neuron while you're thinking about standing on your mind. Yeah, you're still standing. Woo hoo hoo. <laughs> You finished drawing that shit yet, Amy? <laughs> Don't. Just leave me the fuck alone. It's Monday morning, damn it. <laughs> cool. Now, feeling, so Caleb's drinking his green muscle drink again, right? And he's like, woohoo! Don't you dare get on my case today. I've got all sorts of Monday morning anger going on. Okay, but the idea, of course, is to actually open up or close the lid on that required that he actually feel the container. So remember there's a series of receptors that were collecting that information. So let me make sure I get the correct color here. Ooh. Fantastic. So sensation traveled along this neuron here, traveled into the spinal cord, ascended. So let's imagine we're just traveling up. We're going to the thalamus. Second order neuron activates our third order neuron to travel into the cortex. Cool. So that's a review. That's everything, believe it or not, you've covered from 12 to 14. And you're like, really? I don't, I don't remember anybody drawing it out like that at all. <laughs> in fact, the closest you got is inside chapter 12 with that kid with the pencil. And what I've done is I've just sort of summarized it for you. And now I want you to forget all of it. I mean, you can't forget it. We come back to it inside chapter 16. But what we're going to do is we're going to compare it now to something else. You're like, it's Monday morning, man. You can't compare it to anything. You can, actually. I can draw ball and stick. Ball, stick. Yay, with me? And last night on your exam, I asked questions like, I don't know, about cranial nerves and crap like that.
And remember that there are 31 pair of these bloody things that travel down here, creating four major plexuses, right? Cervical, brachial, lumbar. There's another one down here. What was this one called? Sacral. Sacral. Kick ass. Awesome. Also, was that that question was worded? tricky yeah i love when students use that that descriptor with me you know i gotta figure out who's reading and who's not so tricky but is if you are reading you're just not great at reading <laughs> <laughs> so remember if you go back into the lecture i said the textbook says there's four and in some individuals there might be five for a coccygeal okay so but four is the accepted number there's no there's if we went through everybody inside this class, there might be one person with a coccygeal plexus, but in reality, the answer is no. So that's why there's four. What? Yeah. The coccygeal plexus doesn't exist in everybody? No. Is it the one that's in 10% of the population? Something, well, yeah, 10% is less than, right? So. Okay. Okay. What advantages do you have? I should just shut up. Okay, never mind. I take my answer off the air. <laughs> you know, you just start writing those down and just e email them to me. Do you know what I'll do? I'll start classes off with questions from Amy. <laughs> oh my God. Okay, maybe I should do that. Okay. Uh, that's Hey, but that's actually where you guys do the most learning, believe it or not, is when you ask questions like, like that. Okay, so why am I drawing ball and stick and showing these plexuses? for chapter 15. Well, chapter 15 starts with this comparison between the, som the somatic and autonomic nervous systems. And what I did is I highlighted the wiring processes for our somatic sensory and our somatic motor control. That's what all these colors are for, right? That blue going to green and green. Blue is the unipolar neuron with the cell body inside the dorsal root ganglia that activates an unmyelinated interneuron that we're gonna call our second, our second order neuron and then our third order neuron, okay? But the comparison now, of course, is to the autonomic nervous system. And to start that, I need everybody to be on the same page. And by drawing ball and stick and putting these plexuses in here, I can remind you that there is no, I'm gonna just keep with, uh, let's go a different color here. There are no plexuses inside this region of your spinal cord, right? And at the same time, I can remind you that there are 12 pair of cranial nerves here. And by doing that, I can introduce this idea that Mother Nature can build a series of motor responses that exit from the nervous system to regulate your autonomic nervous system. Autonomic. Um, food. My hands are shaking. I haven't had breakfast yet. This is not cold. Anyway, autonomic nervous system. Takes about 20 minutes to read this chap chapter. There are more details inside the tables than there is anything else. And one of the trickier parts about this class is even though it's really informative to sit down and read those tables and try and draw what they are doing, don't get lost in the weeds. Um, piece of information number one. So what's going on here? Why is Mother Nature doing this? Mother Nature needs to figure out a way to innervate. Let's just take a series of colors here and where what's gonna happen, of course. Pay attention to this inside your textbook. They use different coloring systems for the autonomic nervous system relative to the somatic motor nervous system that I drew for you above. And in blue, what I've just drawn for you here is what we call the sympathetic trunk ganglia that surrounds the spinal cord. And you have not seen this yet inside your textbook. When you look at all the spinal structures inside chapter 13, there is nothing that suggests this is, is in existence. So we introduce it now inside chapter 15. And what it's going to do is the sympathetic trunk ganglia is responsible for sending the motor output for sympathetic autonomic targets. So let's go like this under autonomic blue S Y M P. 
And now in red, we're going to say that one, two, three, four, one, two, three, depending on where you are in the textbook, there might be four, four parasympathetic autonomic outputs that are separated by cranial and sacral distributions. Parasym, Y, M, P. And the take home message is this. They are usually 100% antagonistic to one another. And what this means is at each target, there is dual innervation. And that dual innervation means that if a sympathetic motor output has targeted tissue A, it means that there is a parasympathetic motor output that has targeted tissue A as well. There are a couple of notable exceptions and when we get to them, I'll make sure you pay attention to them. But so far so good, right? For those people who are just tuning in, just finishing their cup of coffee, making sure they understood what I'm drawing and recording for you here, the upper part of this first slide is a description of our somatic sensory input and our somatic motor output. The lower part, this cartoon down here, where we've used magenta, blue, and red, describes the autonomic components that are sympathetic and parasympathetic, that duly innervate their targets and act antagonistically. And so the purpose of this chapter is to describe how they're structured, examine the neurotransmitters that are used so that they can be antagonistic to one another. Because one of the things that, you know, you were unaware that you were actually being trained to learn how to do is by looking at all of these polysynaptic pathways we covered inside chapter 13, is imagine if you will, here is cell, let's just go, I gotta get out of that color, that'll confuse people. Uh, let's say that's cell A, I'm gonna go cell B, and let's imagine they're signaling onto a target cell, where now the colors represent the responsibility. So red is parasympathetic, blue is sympathetic. And let's just say target, oh, come up with a color here. I don't know, cyan. Maybe we know what that is, right? If they're both targeting that tissue, they now need to make sure that there is a receptor present for each of these. Go red. Go blue. And at the end of the day, you can already tell me who's going to win. You know who's going to win because that neurotransmitter that signals the most to this cell will now regulate what actually happens at that target tissue. Okay. So, having introduced this idea to you, let's think about what happens next. Oh my God, lots of text. So the somatic nervous system, we've already gone through this. Uh, we haven't gone through the special senses yet, but we will at some point in time, okay? Thursday, okay? Yeah, Thursday and Friday. The autonomic nervous system is gonna receive input from sensory receptors located inside organs, blood vessels, musculature, and the nervous system itself. So really, I don't know if the cartoon is still there. Nope, it's gone, damn it. Okay, but really what this is saying is by using all of the organs inside of your body as well as the nervous system, your hypothalamus and different parts of your nervous system will signal utilizing a wiring system to ensure that antagonistic response. Because remember, even though you don't like this idea, you've probably gotten quite accustomed to it though, you are nothing but a bag of salt water that's regulating different, different ranges for materials inside of your body and your autonomic nervous system is the center of that regulation. 
So here's that somatic motor neuron. And I don't even have to ask you guys uh, to tell me what's going on here now. I know by looking at most of your exams, you have a pretty good idea. That this is our lower motor neuron. It's an A-type fiber. It's myelinated in exocytosis acetylcholine onto the effector skeletal muscle tissue here. However, that cartoon that I drew where we actually looked at red and blue for the autonomic nervous system now needs to be refined. And what you're about to learn is that the autonomic nervous system has two motor neurons that are in series. That's really important because if in our previous cartoon, what I showed you is that this is the lower motor neuron, it's an A-type fiber, it rapidly sends that signal to the effector tissue. Our autonomic nervous system, let's just do this. I will pick blue because it's easier of the two to understand. Remember they're in series, so there's gonna be two of these and one will be myelinated and one will not be myelinated. And we will call this our preganglionic neuron. We will call this our postganglionic neuron. And notice, each of these has ganglion, which means we're going to be forming a ganglion at some point in time in the next few moments. And generally what I do is I just draw it like this because the location of the ganglion is gonna change relative to where we are inside the body. But if this is what's happening inside the sympathetic autonomic nervous system, This is what's happening inside the parasympathetic autonomic nervous system. And what's the difference in these two? Anybody? What, what's, the, what, what's the parasympathetic one? Is that well, what you're asking? Well, yeah, no, so I'm, I'm asking if you were to, you know, if this is, grade school, right? And you were just looking at how these guys are similar, or how they're different, what would you tell me? Um, para, okay, sympathetic is fight or flight and parasympathetic is rest and relaxation. Yeah, but what does that have to do with our cartoon? I don't know. The post-ganglionic is um, shorter, right? What's shorter? The post ganglion. Kick ass, number one. And, but that also means that our preganglionic is what? Longer. Fantastic. And what significance does that have? What do we remember about myelination? It travels faster. Awesome. So of these two, which one actually sing, si signals more rapidly inside your body? Parasympathetic. Awesome. Okay. Now that doesn't usually make sense, especially when Amy said immediately, which meant you paid attention to all of your previous classes that said your sympathetic is fight or flight and your parasympathetic is rest and digest. People make this erroneous conclusion that your parasympathetic nervous system is the slower of the two. In fact, your parasympathetic nervous system is responsible for establishing and maintaining normal homeostasis. And then what happens is your sympathetic nervous system is engineered to temporarily pull your body out of normal homeostatic ranges to survive. So whatever is causing that fight or flight response, it's required all of that but the reality is, is its response is actually slower than what's required to establish normal homeostasis. Okay. Now, now that you actually got that, what seems like trivial distinction, the more, maybe the more important thing to make sure you take away from this slide is that you remember that the autonomic nervous system has two motor neurons, the pre and the post, and these pre and post now need to begin to target tissues. And those targeted tissues, remember I said, if they are antagonistic, it means they have to be similar tissues. 
and those tissues will always be glands. That's what this stands, these circles look like. It's supposed to be some sort of glandular structure. Okay. It's supposed to be your heart. Yay, this is your heart. And it's supposed to be smooth muscle tissue. That's what this target is here. And now to sort of tie the story together, it means that your central nervous system, usually through your hypothalamus, is figuring out some way to regulate glandular responses, cardiac responses, and smooth muscle responses inside of your body using dual innervation from our sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems. Here's a cartoon for this inside your textbook. I forget what the figure page number is. It's the floor right there. But um, you're going to notice that what I did is I drew this portion here. I'll circle these for you. I drew this for you a moment ago. This one here. And I drew this one for you here. So you could clearly see how, if you overlaid them on top of one another, you're going to see that there's a distinct difference in the size of the pre and post ganglionic neurons and the target tissues are the same. Where they are different is the postganglionic autonomic neuron exocytosis, two distinctly different neurotransmitters. And those neurotransmitters will bind the receptors that are found on these target tissues. And that's the basis of that antagonistic response. Now, why didn't I draw this one in there as well? Well, this one's going to confuse you. And that's because even though a moment ago I said that this is the slower of the two systems, Mother Nature has a plan B always. And you already know this. I want you to remember some point in time when you were outside, maybe, I don't know, you're in a city, you didn't know where you were supposed to be, and you rounded a corner and you saw your own shadow. And what the f did you do? You jumped out of your own skin, right? Because the visual input created some response. This actually belongs over here. This actually belongs over here. Okay? Created some response that drove a signal to release acetylcholine inside the adrenal gland and inside the adrenal medulla. You have a population of cells that are derived from neural crest cells, and these make epinephrine and norepinephrine. And this, uh, this adrenal gland, the medulla of the adrenal gland, releases that epinephrine into uh, your circulatory system. And the consequence of that is this, is it is not a precise response at that point in time. It is a complete coverage response. And this is why your body responds the way it does. Vasoconstriction, vasodilation to different locations inside of your body, change the amount of blood flow to those body structures, okay? When you're running for your life, I'm sure you've noticed, you never feel like you have to pee, all right? When you're running for your life, you probably wanna throw up because blood doesn't want to go to your stomach, okay? But your heart has never felt stronger, at least for the first 150 steps or so, okay? Not 15, 150, those first, 100, those first 15 are just, uh, creating kinase being burnt through so you can get rid of the phosphates rapidly. But this, this interplay between normal homeostasis here versus abnormal because you need to now go outside of the normal range of homeostasis, this is the modification that allows that to happen rapidly. You cannot exist in this state for a really long period of time. Okay, it's deleterious to your health. Normal homeostasis is inside here. Stick you outside here for a short period of time while you stay alive. Okay. Cool. Yada, 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 blah, blah, blah. Who cares about that crap? Certainly not me. So how does it all work? Well, you have a series of interoreceptors that we haven't even learned about yet because we're not inside chapter 16, so that's not useful information. But at some point in time, you're going to have to figure out how your body utilizes this system to make sure that the rest of your body is now 
coordinated. And what I mean by that is we're going to think about how it is we use those preganglionic and postganglionic neurons to actually get the work done. So we're going to take a look first at the sympathetic, where the cell bodies of these neurons are located. They're inside the lateral horns, lateral gray horn. That's why I moved that arrow just a moment ago. The lateral gray horns are only found in a specific portion of your spinal column. They're found inside the thoracic portion of your spinal column in the first two or three lumbar segments. So what it actually means is you actually change the shape of your spinal column to allow for, this is an over exaggeration of what you'd actually see, but those cell bodies would be found now inside the lateral gray horns as opposed to posterior and anterior. And what this means is if that's where the cell body is, the axon then exits and is now gonna to travel to a unique route to wherever that target may be inside the body. Remembering you're a bilateral organism, whatever's happening on one side most likely is happening on the other as well for our autonomic nervous system. That isn't the case with our somatic nervous system. So you gotta keep this one piece of information inside the back of your mind for a few minutes while we move on to this cartoon here. And this cartoon is found inside your textbook. And normally what I would do is I'd say, everybody go out and buy some tracing paper and trace this whole thing and place it over one another and learn it. In fact, that's usually what I do. I mean, definitely that's what I did when I had to learn all of these. And what you're going to see is that each of these lines represent a very important piece of information. The solid lines are the preganglionic neurons. The hashed or dotted lines represent the postganglionic neurons. And what I want you to see is that regardless of where you start in T1 through L3, the solid lines will travel to that sympathetic trunk ganglia I drew for you. It seems like an hour ago now, right? And depending upon the importance of that neuron where it's traveling to, you're going to see it either will ascend or descend, and it will either synapse to that postganglionic neuron, or in some instances, you'll have a slightly longer preganglionic neuron to travel out to ganglia that are outside of the spinal cord. Nudge, nudge, hint, hint, wink, wink. These are all what we call prevertebral ganglia. Ciliac, superior mesenteric, renal, so on and so forth. You can see what's happening here. Depending upon the significance of the organ and what the body has to do with it, Mother Nature changes the route, or at least where the ganglia are formed. Okay, now how do you learn all this stuff in one sort of passing like this? I am, yeah, I think if my college professor had walked us through these one at a time, I wouldn't have found this nearly as exciting as it is. But the reality is this, is once you actually step back and see the pattern, right? Why do we actually regulate the heart as much as we do relative to what you're about to see with the parasympathetic nervous system versus say, how do we actually get to that adrenal gland? Take a look at this. When you follow the wiring, you're going to see that we travel in, travel out, and you'll notice that it's one solid line all the way to that adrenal medulla, which means it supports this observation here. And even though you'd never figure it out from this cartoon, this is one preganglionic neuron that is, that is stimulating the release of epinephrine and norepinephrine into your bloodstreams. So what's ever happening here, Mother Nature wants to make sure it is tightly regulated. Okay, So when you're looking at the cartoon, don't get overwhelmed by it. Just pick one thing you think is important, and you'll see that there will be several that I reinforce over the course of you know, the next hour or so. Okay. Now, <clears throat> before we move on, I want to overlay one more important piece of information for you. Let me see if I can just do it. Yeah, I'll just go like this. I'll put a B. Come on. B. B. And B. 
Why did I put bees on top of all of those? Amy? They're all B-type fibers, which means these are all C-type fibers, right? Okay, so that's a major distinction because if we think about, say, our somatic motor nervous system, that lower motor neuron is always gonna be an A-type fiber. Remember, our primary somatosensory neuron is always going to be an A-type fiber. So what Mother Nature is doing here, she's creating a system where information is being sent rapidly, but not that rapidly that your body can't handle the change in the amount of neurotransmitter. Okay. So here's the parasympathetic portion, okay? And a couple things I wanna point out to you. And first of course is the cell bodies again. You're like, why does he like cell bodies so much? The cell bodies tell you Who's telling the entire system to start and when? That's why you want to know where they are, okay? And you're going to see that the, they're the nuclei of four cranial nerves. So you're like, I learned all those cranial nerves and I don't have to forget them immediately. No, you don't. Three, seven, nine, and 10, okay? So what we need to do first is recognize that these four motor outputs are going to be responsible for regulating most of homeostasis inside of your body, okay? Number one. Number two, and then you're gonna see if you go down to the sacral portion of the spinal cord, there's two to four spinal pieces that will send out information as well, and you'll see those here. And this is why earlier in the class, I drew those four lines up here, I drew three or four lines down here, and you can see that the terminal ganglia of the parasympathetic nervous system are found outside of the central nervous system. So ciliary, paratical palatine, submandibular, and otic. These are all part of the glossopharyngeal, the facial, and or the ocular motor nerves. You will notice that the vagus nerve creates its ganglia at the target tissue. Okay, so if we think about what that actually means, that means that all of these B fibers are targeting the C fibers inside their target tissue. So this is what I mean when I say this is what most tightly regulates normal homeostasis inside the viscera of your body. Okay, that makes sense. You may not understand it yet, but your vagus nerve is continually telling your heart to go slower, okay? You may not like that idea. You're like, I need my heart to go faster, but sometimes it does. Most of the time, you actually tell your heart to slow down, okay? Now down here, what's going to happen is you'll notice the pelvic splanchic nerves look like they essentially are wired similarly to that vagus nerve. So things such as kidney function, by kidney function, I mean specifically, you're gonna notice it is the bladder function that's being regulated and then more slowly the flow rate from the bladder, I mean, from the kidney to the bladder, as well as your reproductive structures are regulated through the pelvic splanchic nerves. So there's something interesting going on there, right? Well beyond our pay grade for this class, but the reality is this, when you look at this and you say, oh, okay, I have a really good idea what's going on now. My B-type fiber signals to the C-type fiber for the glandular responsibilities, say, for the face. Or if we move down here to, say, the glossopharyngeal nerve, you're gonna notice that the parotid glands and submandibular glands are regulated here as well. When we travel down to, say, the vagus nerve, it's essentially all of the viscera in the ventral cavity of your body that are regulated from the vagus nerve. Okay. That is cool when you think about it, but whatever. Okay, <clears throat> so how does this all actually work? We put the whole series together. I wanna to go backwards for just one second because this is something that gets overlooked. 
when we come and we look at exceptions, and this will be an exceptional exception, okay? When you think about what it is your sweat glands are actually doing inside your body, it makes sense if I tell you a story. And by story, I want you to actually live through this. And I'm gonna send Catherine to the board. Catherine, I don't even know if you're awake or with us right now. We're gonna send you to the board and I'm gonna have you draw a ball and stick and explain to me where you're going to put the parasympathetic and sympathetic motor output. What do you got for me? Um, you got a response, this is good. <laughs> I don't really quite understand the question, go again. Okay, cool, but now just tell me this. If I called on you randomly like this and we were inside a classroom and I had you stand up and go to the board, what would happen? Um, I'd go to the board. Kick ass. What's your heart doing right now? Beating. Okay, cool. What are your hands doing right now? Sweating. Fantastic. What's happening inside your mouth at exactly the same time? Salivating. Is it? Mm. No, it's dry. Fantastic, right? So these are all of the responses that are abnormal when we're thinking about what the sympathetic nervous system is doing at your skin. So I need you to tuck this away and we'll come back to it at the end of chapter 15. Catherine, thank you very much. Gosh. Cool. Now you can go back and you can feel your heart rate start to lower. How does that feel? <laughs> Okay, cool. So with that in mind, you're going to see that we have to figure out how Mother Nature actually wires all of these targets, which is where we're going to go to next. Okay. Wham. So here, voila, you see why I did that, right? Okay. So here, when we're thinking about the fact that in blue, we have a series of sympathetic preganglionic and sympathetic postganglionic structures. And what I want you to do is inside this figure here, I want you to see that arising from that lateral gray horn, okay, notice in this cartoon they actually drew one in for you, okay, they actually send the preganglionic neuron out through that anterior rootlet. And then depending upon where it actually has to target, a series of things can happen. And what I want to make sure you understand is that the construction of that um, ganglia, the, the sympathetic trunk ganglia are along the side of the spinal cord is really just a series of on-ramps and off-ramps. Okay, so when you're looking at this, let's imagine we want to target, say, that heart. The preganglionic neuron is going to travel out around, travel into, okay, the white ramus communicans, but not yet. If you see a solid gray line, it means you're still in the gray communicants, the myelinated portion. When you move to the dotted line, let's imagine we're going to target that heart now, our synapse inside the ganglion suggests that we have now moved to an unmyelinated neuron Okay, and that would mean something similar here. Now, notice I said myelinated and not myelinated there. Okay, and I think I just said it incorrectly, so I want to go backwards. Gray represents myelinated structures, and white represents unmyelinated structures, correct or not correct? That is what you just said. <laughs> Fantastic, right? Because this is confusing. Because we are in unmyelinated structure, the cell body is here, but this is a myelinated neuron exiting, correct? Okay, so I want to make sure you're paying attention to the fact that white tracks are myelinated, gray tracks are unmyelinated, which means when we're actually exiting here, this unmyelinated neuron is actually, it will be targeting antagonistically what the vagus nerve is going to do next. Another, another nudge, 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 hint, hint, wink, wink. And that's going to be take a look at, this is now the second or third time I'm pointing this out to you. If we wanted to target, say, that chromaffin cell, notice that our B-type fiber travels, my God, looks like it travels down a 
around through the ciliac ganglion, travels and then targets our chromaffin cell here. Okay, so even though I just added another piece of information, I highlighted the fact that it's traveling out of the ciliac ganglion, I wanted primarily for you to see that it was myelinated. Okay. So, what I don't want you doing, notice I just said capital D, capital O, capital N, apostrophe T, capital T, right? I don't want you memorizing the routes. I want you to say, oh, look, it's the second or third time now he's mentioned those chromaffin cells. It's at least the third or the fourth time. And the chromaffin cells, to target them, we actually have to travel through the ciliac ganglion. And you want to make sure that that ciliac ganglion is part of the prevertebral ganglion. And each of these will be your hint as to which system you are in. Okay. Does everybody understand what I'm saying when I say that? Does anybody understand what I'm saying when I'm saying that? If I mention the otic ganglion or I mention the submandibular, or I mention the ciliary, that means you know immediately it's part of the terminal ganglia and that means you know immediately that it's part of the parasympathetic nervous system. Okay. So instead of memorizing all of the routes, pay attention to the landmarks. Pelvic splanchic nerves, part of the cranial sacral pathways. Therefore, you're immediately in the parasympathetic nervous system. Cool. Oh, <clears throat> that cartoon there, this is just how does Mother Nature target all those tissues as rapidly as she does? She creates plexuses for the autonomic nervous system, and that's what you're looking at here. But there's your sympathetic trunk ganglia on both sides. Does that make sense? Okay. <clears throat> so here's an autonomic motor pathway, right? And you're going to see here again motor arising, lateral gray horn traveling down, thinking to yourself, this makes perfect sense except that we're targeting the bladder. Okay, so it's a red line, so it's parasympathetic. Do we actually have a lateral gray horn that low in our spinal column? Question mark number one. Forgetting about that, what I want you to think about is this. How do they work? Okay. Let's go back to that cartoon. I'll explain to you why, why I did that. If I said, this is your B fiber, your B type fiber here, come on. I said, this is our B type fiber here. Now everybody knows that this is myelinated. Yay. Fantastic. Woohoo. You're with me. What neurotransmitter was used here? Does anybody remember from the first cartoon? Acetylcholine, ACH. That's right, I didn't highlight it for you. I just wanted to see. I did tell you that acetylcholine was used here. So for all parasympathetic pre and post ganglionic neurons, the neurotransmitter will always be acetylcholine. Okay. That means once you've learned one, all you need to do now is learn how the other is different. And that's what's going to happen here. Adrenergic neurons are going to release norepinephrine or epinephrine, okay, depending upon what our target's going to be. But the idea now is what we're doing is we are changing the names of our neurons. I'll make sure you understand when I say that. Oh, let's do this one. Let's go here. Go like this. Go like this. Go like this. Go like that versus here. Well, oh, that's not a good drawing. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Frustrated artist. Okay. <laughs> Doink. Let's go like this. Let's go like this. That. Let's go like that. So I can exaggerate the fact 
you're supposed to be paying attention to the distinction between these two. All right, the one I just told you about, this will use a CH here. Now the part you're not expecting is that this uses a CH here. I'm using this and that intentionally. I'm not trying to confuse you just yet, although I'm sure somebody will accuse me of it later. And E. E. Okay, so I told you all this before. Okay, so let's go back to red here. I'm gonna put an ACH here. And you're gonna notice what we're doing is we're about to change the names of the neurons. You're like, no, I just got down B-type fiber and C-type fiber. Why the hell would you do that to me? Because we can. Okay, <laughs> and that means that this preganglionic parasympathetic neuron is actually a cholinergic neuron. Oh, that's supposed to be a C, sorry about that. Doesn't look like it. Cholinergic. And this postganglionic parasympathetic autonomic neuron is also releasing acetylcholine. So this means this is also a cholinergic neuron. So I'll put a big C there, fantastic. You're like, yay, I got the pattern. Our preganglionic sympathetic autonomic nervous system is releasing acetylcholine. So somebody tell me what type of neuron it is. Cholinergic. Awesome, happy instructor moment. <laughs> like, yay, cool, fantastic. Now the one you're not expecting, our postganglionic sympathetic autonomic neuron is releasing epinephrine and norepinephrine, and it gets a new name, and that is an adrenergic neuron, okay? So I'm just gonna put a big A underneath that. Not in red, Jonathan, not in red. That will confuse people. Add re. Whatever. Okay, cool. <laughs> so now you actually have a much better idea of some of the complexity for how we can signal between these neurons. We've just only started them. You're what? You're like, how? Well, acetylcholine and epinephrine and norepinephrine have to bind receptors, which means cholinergic receptors are broken up into two types. And of course, you should not have used the color. Oh, to tell. Okay. Well, it's both useful and not useful. Dude, let's go to red. So for acetylcholine being released by cholinergic neurons, it has two possibilities. It could bind to a nicotinic receptor or a muscarinic receptor. And here's the general rule. The general rule is nicotinic receptors are excitatory. Muscarinic receptors, generally speaking, are inhibitory. Now, why did I put the plus and the minus there? Plus meaning depolarization, minus meaning hyperpolarization on the cell bodies of the targets with those receptors on it. Adrenergic neurons, you're like, hey man, well, you're not telling us that there are different types of receptors for that. Oh, don't you wish that was the case. In fact, there are five different receptors. There's alpha one, beta one, alpha two, beta two, and beta three, beta three. Okay, now I grouped them together for a reason. I group them together because alpha one and beta one, generally speaking, are excitatory. Alpha two and beta two, that's supposed to be a two, it looks like a three in my mind's eye. Okay, alpha two and beta two, generally speaking, are inhibitory. And that means exactly the same thing I meant a moment ago. That means excitatory should cause a depolarization, inhibitory should cause a hyperpolarization. Beta three, Beta-3 is a cute story, 
Jessica. I want you to think back to some of your baby pictures. Like, I don't want to think back to my baby pictures. I don't care what you want. Think back to your goddamn baby pic pictures, right? You want you to think you had those cute little rosy cheeks and your little appendages, they were all like puffy and stuff, right? And they were puffy because you were loaded up with a specific type of brown adipose tissue. And that brown adipose tissue was keeping your sorry ass alive. It's keeping you alive because it was literally acting as a thermal resistance barrier, okay? And what happens is while you're in that state, your cells are decorated with beta-3 receptors. And those beta-3 receptors are then activated to burn through that adipose tissue as you begin to increase your own energetic stores, okay? So the more you actually eat, the less you need the brown tissue, and therefore thermogenesis regulates beta-3 receptors or is regulated through beta-3 receptors. Now you're an adult, you don't need that crap, okay? So we don't tend to think about it in this class, but you should know that there are five different adrenergic receptors. And generally speaking, these are the rules. Alpha-1, beta-1, excitatory. Alpha-2, beta-2, inhibitory. Now notice I said every single time here, generally speaking. Yes, you know what that means immediately. Okay. <clears throat> now remember I said a moment ago, there's going to be a curveball or two along the way. And remember I sent poor Catherine to the board there and she was like, what the hell, man? I'm sitting here with my, I'm going to say, Catherine, you're wearing fluffy, I'm going to say puppy dog slippers and you're still drinking a half cold cup of coffee, wishing you were someplace else. Sound about right? Water, but yes. <laughs> Kick ass, right? Okay, cool. And remember a moment ago, I said you were going to go to the board and we were going to use the sympathetic nervous system and you're like, I got you. Okay? Here's where that experience is different and this is why I'm pointing it out to you. When you actually went to the sympathetic innervation of sweat glands on your body, the target there was actually a muscarinic receptor. You're like, whoa, sympathetic nervous system, man. That's not right. It should have been an adrenergic receptor. In fact, it utilizes acetylcholine to activate that muscarinic receptor. And that's why I pointed it out to you guys. So this is one of the major exceptions that shows up again and again on all of your professional exams. Okay, It's an exception within the autonomic nervous system where sympathetic regulation utilizes not only cholinergic preganglionic pre neurons and postganglionic neurons, as well as the receptors on the target tissue now actually being excitatory. And muscarinic receptors, a moment ago I told you were what? Inhibitory. So now you can see why this is an important exception to pay attention to. Coolio. Oh, okay. The hard part of the chapter is now over. So the rest of the book itself, right, literally, okay, is going through the major target tissues inside of the body and explaining what's going on. I'm not going to read these tables to you. In fact, I'm not even going to tell you to memorize these tables. In fact, I'm going to cherry pick and then I'm going to make you stand 10 feet back and see if you can tell me the pattern. Okay. So cholinergic, nicotinic, nicotinic, generally speaking, they're excitatory, as I told you a moment ago. And you'll notice that you find chromaffin cells in the adrenal medulla, the sarcolemma of the motor end plate. All of this makes sense. Let's take a look at some of these alpha receptors. Alpha-1. Alpha-1 receptors, generally speaking, we're going to find them on the smooth muscle fibers in blood vessels. Okay, that makes sense. They serve salivary glands, kidney, blah, blah, blah. But notice what actually happens here. Excitation generally causes constriction or contraction. And you'll also notice we would have done this inside lab by now, so it would have made more sense. Whoops, backwards, sorry about that, guys. It would have made more sense. Inside lab, you, did a, you would have done a autonomic reflexes lab where you actually take a flashlight and you, you actually point it into somebody's eye on one side of their face, 
and you look at what happens in the opposite eye, the, uh, the contralateral eye. Okay, and by what you're going to look at is you're going to look at the dilation or the constriction as a result of that. Those alpha-1 receptors are going to regulate this. You also do another test where you actually stroke the back of somebody's neck and you're actually then feeling, they're feeling one thing and their eyes are doing another thing and you report out what that would actually be. So now what's going to happen, of course, is if we have different types of receptors, now here's this alpha-2, here are the major locations. Notice I'm not even reading them out to you. Notice that essentially it's inhibition, decreased inhibition. And this is why people say, generally speaking, it's an inhibitory response. But notice over here in other parts of your body. So Catherine, when you went to the board, the palms of your hands and the soles of your feet, those were actually utilizing alpha-2 receptors and they did increase their sweating. So these were acting in a different manner than the ones, say, underneath your armpits or across your brow while you're standing in front of the class. Beta one, cardiac muscle fibers, the one to remember if you're gonna remember something, okay? In fact, I'll reinforce it several times throughout the rest of the semester. The beta one receptors on your cardiac musculature cause an increase in the force and the rate of constriction. The others, we don't tend to worry about, but this is when you're actually going to the gym and you're you know, stressed out about something. This is what actually breaks down triglycerides, beta-1 receptors on your adipose cells. Finally though, beta-2, these are the cool ones. These are the ones you probably wanna be aware of for AMP2 when we're thinking about what, cover, what, what will actually work here. It may not seem like an important thing to understand, but inhibition utilized by beta-2 receptors causes dilation inside your airways and vasodilation and relaxation of organ walls. Very important when we're thinking about how it is uh, we actually get enough gases into and out of the body. I want to take a look at, now that I've told you that, where they're found inside the body as we finish this morning up. We're not we're finished, I'm gonna go back to the beginning and sort of tell the whole story one more time. Let's take a look at, so these are, actually I'm gonna open up my textbook in front of me here, sorry about that. So I wanna give you page numbers to pay attention to. So table 15.3 is a really concise description in the comparison between sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. You'll find that on page 540 inside your textbook. That was this figure here, right there, okay? But when we're thinking about how the effects are similar and different, table 15.4 is the table you just wanna look at generally. And you'll see that there is a pattern. And the pattern is what are the glands? What are the visceral effectors? And then what is the smooth muscle effector? Okay, there's a visceral effector. And then what is the smooth muscle effector? So you remember that cartoon? So it's all table 15.4, nudge, nudge, hint, hint, wink, wink. See if we can get to the end here. Okay, cool. So, yeah, you notice I just jumped right through that. And you're like, wait, whoa, 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 there's a lot of information there. You're going to go read it. Tomorrow I'm going to ask you some questions about it. Okay, but again, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to draw this up here now. Wow, short. I'm going to put this down here. Let me do this. Lamb, 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 lamb. I'm going to do this. Oh, come on. Sweet mother of jumping Jehoshaphat. Kick ass. 
And you'll notice that that table represents this cartoon, or at least this piece in the cartoon. This is your heart from now on, by the way. You've moved away from your St. Valentine's Day cards. Okay, and then smooth this out. Okay, so the purposes of studying the table would be something along the lines of, are there any examples where you can find smooth muscle that is regulated primarily through a specific, how do I say this? A specific sympathetic output versus a specific parasympathetic output. Okay, that's what you're looking at the table for. Sort of similar to that cartoon. What we can do to finish up this morning though, oh my God, we can finish up this morning by just simply reviewing. Here, this is what you built today. When you woke up this morning, you didn't know you were gonna build and understand the autonomic nervous system. Maybe you did. At one point in time inside the chapter, they say that there are two motor neurons required for your autonomic nervous system to function, and they did not lie. They have a pre and they have a post for both, unless you're thinking about some exceptions. There's usually a ganglion between each of them, right? But now by the time you finish the chapter, you know that our preganglionic neuron can also be called a B-type fiber, okay? and it can also be called a cholinergic type fiber. That's what the C stands for. I'll just put C-H-O, okay? Likewise, down here, pre, B, cholinergic. And we know that because it exocytoses acetylcholine, ACH, on both parts, ACH. Cool. Now our postganglionic neuron for our parasympathetic nervous system is a C-type fiber, and it is also a cholinergic neuron, CHO. Our postganglionic sympathetic neuron, though, is a postganglionic C-type fiber, but this is a adrenergic neuron, ADR. And that means it exocytoses, I'm gonna say epi and nor. Okay, your textbook focuses on nor, N-O-R. Cool. Now, how do you make sense of how this functions then? This is why you wanna go back and look at those tables on your own. Using this really simple cartoon, if these are glands, if this is cardiac tissue, if this is smooth muscle, how do you apply, say, nicotinic receptors, NIC versus, it's supposed to be a VS, muscarinic, and, I'm gonna put an and here, alpha one, beta one, alpha two, beta two, okay? And that's really your thinking homework for this evening, right? Because you know, if I had, if we were, I did buy a whiteboard, maybe I'll try this tomorrow. I don't know how this will all work, work out. But what normally what I would draw is I'd put this really big drawing up on the board and I'd say, Oh, are there glands where there's a specific ratio of, say, nicotinic and um, beta-1 receptors or nicotinic and beta-2 receptors? I want you to look that closely without trying to memorize it. That's not the point. The point isn't to memorize what you find on exactly which cell types. In fact, the only one I want you to remember for probably tomorrow when we start our lecture is, remember, we have beta-1 receptors on cardiac muscle tissue so that it will contract more forcefully. So let's then even go back further than this and remember how I actually started the class off. I think I drew this up there, right? And I put green and green. And I put this down here. Fantastic, cool. So now 
really as we are approaching the end of the semester, what you're doing is you're realizing that what Mother Nature is doing is if this is, I'm gonna draw ball and stick, right? Ball and stick up here. One, two, three, four. And you remember the cranial nerves that are being used here, as well as the ganglia. G A N G. And then down here, oh, I should make sure I put in the sacral portion there. Sorry about that. Cranial sacral portion. Let's make sure we do this. Notice I'm starting in a specific place, right? Both sides. I'm not going to draw all of them out, obviously. And these guys all come out here. And we're going to find our ganglia here. G-A-N-G. -G. Okay. When you compare this cartoon to this cartoon here, notice what I have to do to make sure you understand what Mother Nature is doing. Sensory input. Travels to a specific location, travels to there, and that has this ribbon, right? If I'm sitting here thinking, I'm drawing all this stuff out, I'm like inside chapter 16, travel down interiorly. One, two. By the time you get to the final, you should be able to draw these without even thinking about it, and knowing that we haven't told you what neurotransmitters are working here. We haven't told you what neurotransmitters are working there. We haven't even suggested a neurotransmitter that might be working here. The only one we've told you is the neurotransmitter that works here. Notice up here, we told you every single neurotransmitter that's working, the possible receptor it could be binding to, and what it does to change, even if they don't state it exactly, to change physiology. Remembering that parasympathetic is what establishes and maintains normal homeostasis, and then the sympathetic nervous system is what's responsible for taking you out of range temporarily and then allowed to go back to normal. Questions? It's a lot of information. <laughs> Amy's like, why, why? It's because we care about you. We want your neurons to grow. We do. We want you to form new synapses. We want you to feel like your life is worth living. I just turned 30. I mean, I don't think any of that is possible anymore. <laughs> of course it is. Are you kidding with me? Demonstrate frequently. 80-year-olds, movement from your hip, hippocampus to, to new neurogenesis now, no problem. Seriously. Okay. Got, yeah, that whatever they used to tell, tell you. There are, nerve, there are neurons that will never be replaced once they're lost, but things like memory, learning, uh, balance, it's all still very plastic. It's just once you stop, getting it back is really hard. So is there an actual regeneration of, of a neuron happening, or is it just like the strengthening of the dendritic connections and synapses? Great question, Ryan. And for two different reasons, right? Depending upon the system we're actually talking about. Matt, so I'm, so I'm looking down here to say our somatic motor and somatic sensory. So in animals, not in humans yet, generation of new neurons, okay? We can't cut open humans yet to do these experiments. But what we know is there's new electrical activity that 
if it parallels what we see inside animals, it means new neurons. The wiring piece that you're talking about, the exciting piece that people are yeah. now beginning to appreciate is that the pathways to actually learn how to learn, the pathways to, you know, to remember how to balance and all of that, the interactions with the myelination, believe it or not, seem to be hmm. what maintain the actual fidelity and fluency with which your body can get back to where it was performing beforehand. Very interesting stuff. Yeah, no, it, this is, I mean, for me, this is completely fascinating the, because we've known for a long time that the, the glial cells are responsible for maintaining, just say, the electrical activity, but you literally change the diameter of the glial cells as well as you try to re-engage and or try to learn something new. There's a whole series of technologies out there now that are, you know, how then do you refine the pathways as you're learning them, you know? So are the, oh, I'm sorry? Electro, are, are the signals just moving more efficiently? Yeah, the that's the whole point of the myelination, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So, the, I mean, so even though, you know, I'm sure by now you're sick of me as saying this, right? You learn how to draw the simple stuff first, then you go in and you overlay the, more and more refined information on top of it. The rationale behind that is you learn the simple pathway first and then you just decorate it with more and more information because literally that's what's actually happening inside your nervous system as now that information travels to your hippocampus. And then when you go to sleep at night, because you've thought about it, that's when it gets reinforced and then passed into your long-term memory. Hey, that was a test question. <laughs> Kick ass! <laughs> <laughs> the coffee's finally starting to kick in. Yeah, that's a good thing. I, I was I was afraid you had gone on a bender over the week weekend and you were sitting there like you did like last Monday or maybe it was two mon Mondays ago. You're like, no, I can't do this. No, no, no I was I was pretty tame. Good, fantastic. Got to preserve those brain cells. They are needed, believe it or not. <laughs> Okay, any other questions? No? So uh, we're running out of space. I mean, they told me uh, earlier that I've run out of space to store these things. So I'm gonna try turning them into YouTube videos and putting them up on YouTube for you, but we gotta figure out a way to make sure it's private for the class. And I'm sure there's somebody who knows how to do that, but I gotta go learn how to do it first because I don't want you guys answering questions and then feeling like you're being exposed to the worldwide dreb, right? It's like, it's like oh, you, you should. I'm you, sure you should everyone knows that I don't care. <laughs> yeah, but perhaps Sarah does, you know? <laughs> I talked to her about it earlier. She said it's fine. It's completely fine. Okay, well, then I won't worry about kidding, making Sarah, it I don't know. private and I'll just download this and I'll, what I'll do is I'll just start putting the links to these right on Blackboard for, for you. How many of you actually go back and watch them again? Or is this sort of like a, like a, a blanket. No, you don't even know. Just you're just reading and trying to survive. No, I've Thanks. I've gone I've gone back and listened to a few points. Yeah, I watch them too sometimes. Okay. <laughs> There's so much that you provided us with that's like uh like extra and filler that I just like I I there's sometimes the what's better for my learning style is like the representation of a same of the same information so that I can sort of like contextualize it on my own instead yes. of listening it to or listening to how you said it the same way twice like if you present it in a different way on the shorter YouTube videos that'll be that's better for me okay cool so and so although I haven't put that list up yet I'll definitely do that right after class right right now but yeah there's Chapter 15, 16, and 17 is up there as well, and I'll make sure you guys have access to, to that. But, you know, and of course, the reason why I put both the one hour and thing up and the shorter ones, we know that when you're watching long videos, you tend to pay attention less. We know that when your brain says, this thing is only 12 minutes or 15 minutes, the actual perception you're paying attention is actually greater. So that's, that's the, rash, the rationale behind it. Okay, you guys have a wonderful day. Um, 
Woohoo! I will see you guys tomorrow morning, eight o'clock. Tomorrow's Tuesday. Does anybody else feel a certain amount of momentum building inside this class? Like we're actually starting to come to the end of all of this? Like really? Yeah, def definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm starting to feel like, whoa, we're going to get, we're, we're going to be done on Friday. What the as long I as I don't remember that, like, we still have A&P too, then yes, I feel that way. <laughs> Um, we're, we're gonna, are we gonna talk about like labs that, um, uh, like next for next week, this week? Yeah. So, yeah. So if I'm being, if I, I need to shut the recording piece off. Okay. I'm going to shut this yeah. off. Not to add anything. Additional well, yeah, no. well not gender. so much that is like, I don't want my boss to hear what I'm about to say. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. What the hell? Pause recording.